from the day one. I believe that Melly was responsible for my son on October 26th when I first heard the story because his explanation, when I finally talked to him in Portland on a FaceTime, their response and how they was reacting, they showed no remorse. They didn't act like they was grieving, like they lost a best friend or nothing. They was, in, in my opinion, they was in the best spirits. They didn't even, they wasn't reacting to, they act like they didn't, they didn't have to take a loss at all. That's how I, that's how I took it. And then when I was talking to them, I still had in the back of my, my mind, that did, something's not right. Is it too late for Cortland to plea? Uh, no, I don't <laughs> think it's too late. Uh, it's never too late. Uh, I've had uh, individuals been offered offered pleas, but turned them down in the in the middle of trial. Uh, I've had people offered pleas before a verdict came back. Uh, so it, it just depends on the case, depends on the prosecutor, depends on the actual charges. Uh, so no, it's never too late for that. Uh, he could he could take a plea in the middle of his case. I don't think that would happen. Uh, if he was going to take a plea, if there was going to be a deal, it would be in the middle uh, of Melly's case. With the YNW Melly retrial now being set for October 9th, this now gives YNW Bortland's trial to start on October 2nd all by himself. Sources reveal the state is doing this to give YNW Bortland a chance to go on and make a plea deal and snitch against YNW Melly. So that one week's worth of trial before YNW Melly's begins will now be structured in a way to give Bortland a chance to plea and to tell the truth of what happened to Sack Chaser and Juvie on that night. The state is very smart because of moments after the YNW Melly mistrial was granted, YNW Bortland would tweet something about YNW Melly. <laughs> Uh, so at this time, uh, what uh, I'm going to do is just uh, declare this trial this this trial. Uh, and uh, again, I want to thank you very much for your time and attention. I uh, very much appreciate it. You're free to go. All right, let's score now. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> As after the mistrial was granted, a report would go on and share, YNW Bortland tweets a mysterious message on the same day YNW Melly's mistrial was declared, which the tweet goes and shares, mind games don't work on people like me, alongside a handshake emoji as if he's accepting some sort of deal. Now during the entire YNW Melly trial, Melly's lawyers were playing mind games with the jury, hinting towards Bortland being the guilty one and not YNW Melly. And now we are seeing YNW Borland himself subtweet the mind games phrase. Throughout the entire Melly trial, his lawyers just continued on hinting towards Borland. Even 15 minutes into day one, the opening statement made by YNW Melly's lawyer to the jury stated that Borland is the one that had powder residue on his hands. Melly's lies, those were his lies. Cortland Henry shows up at Memorial Hospital, Miramar. You don't see him sitting there, but where you will see him sitting is in the driver's seat of a car with two bodies, a car riddled with And when he shows up, he shows up with a change of clothing, change of shirt, had a residue on his hands, evidencing that he had discharged a firearm. <clears throat> And he lies. <coughs> he lies about where the incident occurred. He lies about how it occurred. And he lies about not having the phone. I think it was Miss Bradley herself who said, everybody has a phone in his pocket, not Cortland Henry. There were three phones. Now that was 15 minutes into day one of the YNW Melly trial. He's also been revealing that YNW Borland was telling lies to the feds throughout the entire trial and the interrogation. As he's the one with powder residue on his hands, Borland was the last one with YNW Juvie and Sack Chaser. As YNW Melly's lawyer would also reveal to the jury the interview of YNW Borland lying to detectives during the investigation. And I'm driving, ducking for my life, trying to make sure I don't get hit. And you telling me, you work, you telling me about this shit. I don't, man, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to make sure I don't get hit. I don't, I'm, man, I'm driving. 
I'm trying to make sure I don't get hit. You know what I'm saying? I, what I'm going to be worried about? You know what I'm saying? I, I know it's not for you to worry about. Shit crazy, bro. But if you tell me it happened there, there's got to be some evidence there. There's going to be broken glass, just like there's broken glass over here from when you guys opened the, the doors and stuff like that. Okay, there's going to be broken glass over there when the windows got shit out. There's going to be casings from the people at your car okay there's gonna be stuff evidence over there okay right now there's nothing i kind of think i know what happened because i got information as this would not even be the end of the evidence against ynw borland being brought up during ynw melly's trial either we would see a forensic scientist that covered the passings go into further detail about borland having powder residue on his hands so the um right hand of Cortland Henry contained zero particles characteristic of powder residue and two two-component particles. And the left hand contained one particle characteristic of powder residue and one two-component particle. Okay. And can you explain to us what that means? Basically, um, overall, there was powder residue present on the hands. As YNW Borland was just watching this happen during Melly's trial, not being able to defend himself or even tell Melly's lawyers to stop bringing up his name. This now leads YNW Borland to no other option but to snitch on YNW Melly, or he's going to be looking at life in prison for a crime that he didn't even do. This is then when we would see YNW Borland brought into the courtroom and given his court date for October 2nd. Portland Henry? Yes, sir. He's present. But you want to back to the Dallas conference? Come on up. Hey, I, don't, I guess you're already proud of the code that's not around no. We're set for October 3rd for trial. Do you have a motion pending as well? Yes, Judge. Yes. The court, when we were here the last time, you let him go to church and stuff. You said about working, you would be subject to seeing his schedule. We filed a schedule for the next couple of months. I saw that. Be able to work. And uh, I talked to his probation supervisor. She has no problem with him at all. She said that if he's going to go to work, she'd like, like anybody has to do, provide an itinerary, where he's going to be, how he's going to get there, how it's going to get done. As while YNW Borland was inside of the courtroom, sources claim from people inside of the trial, YNW Melly was seen starting to break down as well as looking emotional. However, it's important to remember ever since YNW Melly was originally locked up in 2018, it's been the YNW group's main priority to make Melly look innocent and not really so much Borland. As even in the lawsuit against Melly, it goes and reads, Defendant 100K Track assisted Melly and Borland with the collection and disposal of the firearm used to commit the crime. As if it is true 100k track did dispose of the firearm that was used, it makes this interview he did with DJ Academics feel very strange, as well as this helping out YNW Melly's case in a massive way. He we, he built a real great solid team away from just being innocent because he wouldn't do such a crime. He prepared himself and got a proper, you know, defense their job is to handle their self in trial not on social media you guys are taking it that way if they say they got dna in a car i'm just gonna tell you melly dna was found in the car you're gonna think yeah his dna was found in the car the day of the oh he jumped in a car and his dna was in the car he did it okay but you're not gonna put the fact that this was his car for six seven months on, on, on those documents and dockets and just automatically be like yo he's he's fried you don't even know what the defense is. You don't even know what the rebuttal is. You don't even know why that situation occurred. You hear ballistics flying. You don't know what the defense is. You hear this, you hear that. You get what I'm saying? I'm going to be honest. As stated by 100K Track, he reveals YNW Melly has solid defenses for himself. However, YNW Melly's defenses make YNW Borland look extremely guilty, starting with the no firearm being found in this court case. Why not? So uh, the, the first thing is I didn't have a firearm, so I can't know which I'm going to use um, in order to replicate any of my tests. So I can't make tests for the determination because I don't know what I was used. Okay. Do you have a... Which then leads into the testimony from YNW Melly's sixth grade best friend, Adrian Davis. As Davis would reveal, YNW Melly wasn't even at the crime scene. Are you 100% sure? that Melly got into the red Mitsubishi 
to go home. Yes. Are you 100% sure that this young man learned of the of these of his friends at the exact same time you learned of it? Yes. And that was at the house. Yes. Are you 100% sure that when people were getting on the phone that this young man was looking for his phone to call people? Yes. If YNW Melly wasn't at the crime scene, that then means YNW Bortland was the only person that was with Sack Chaser and Juvie when this incident went down. Adrian Davis would even double down his claims of YNW Melly not being there, sharing that YNW Melly was picked up by the YNW members in the red vehicle at the recording studio. The members in the red car needed somebody with house keys to allow them into the YNW crib. Okay, so the only two people you know who had a key to the house house was this young man yes and Cortland Henry yes did you see this young man unlock the, the door of the house yes who was the last person to get out of the red Mitsubishi to go inside the house Trayvon he was in the cost asleep did you see where Melly went to his room. And where was his bedroom? Uh, when you first walked in the house, it came misses right down the left. Okay. This is a one or two story house. Two which makes the case very strange now. If they needed YNW Melly to come home for house keys, this means that YNW Bortland, the only other person with a set of keys, was not even planning on going home that night. Which then raises the question, why wasn't YNW Bortland going home on this night? As he did live in the YNW crib at this time. We would then even see Adrian Davis again claim that he saw YNW Melly walk to the front door, open the door, and walk straight to his bedroom to go to sleep. Then while sleeping, sleeping for roughly an hour or two, members in the YNW crib would begin screaming and yelling for everybody to wake up as they were just learning what happened to Sack Chaser and Juvie. Did there come a time in the early morning hours that you were woken up and heard some distressing news? Uh, yes. What did you hear? Uh, the second Juvie was when you heard that, did you see Melly in the house? Yes. Did you see Melly how he was dressed in the house? Yes. What was he wearing? Uh, shorts and a t-shirt, I think. As Adrian Davis reveals, he saw YNW Melly in the house, but he didn't see YNW Borland. So where was YNW Borland once again? Davis reveals he saw Melly go out of his bedroom wearing a t-shirt and shorts. With Adrian Davis making these claims in trial, it gives YNW Melly an alibi. However, it puts YNW Borland at the crime scene, the only one not at the YNW crib alongside Sack Chaser and Juvie. When you take into account everything, and now with the rumors circulating about the potential potential of YNW Bortland snitching, O Block resident Jay Hood, a friend of King Vaughn, would reveal something very unexpected during an interview this week, as King Vaughn may have mentioned a little too much to a group of people that live in O Block, as Jay Hood would reveal all. Did Vaughn really tell you that Melly told him that he was two friends? He ain't come out and say, like, we got into an argument, and so you know, if, if, if you know, when people could say something without saying it. And so he told me, like, once I posted what I posted, he Vaughn was mad at me, bro. Why you put up there, bro? Walk the bam. I'm like, you you sitting up here, like, you know the love we got. You do this for us, but you gonna trust that a his two friends? And he said, them was trying to extort him. And so I'm like, if they was trying to extort him, then, then why are you still around him? He revealed information that we never even knew, involving YNW Sack Chaser and YNW Juvie going after YNW Melly for financial gain. King Vaughn and YNW Melly were best friends. They made multiple songs together, such as Rolling, including the famous jail phone call that Lil Durk and King Vaughn had with YNW Melly. Bust, you got tippy. Bust out of the mouth. <laughs> It's me. It's the right, right, I mean. It's you all. I said, I said, 
On top of this, weirdly enough, YNW Bortland's interrogation interview from 2018 would also then be leaked moments after J Hood's interview. As YNW Bortland can be heard stating this crime happened out of jealousy. However, it's very clear that Bortland is lying throughout the entire interrogation. Let, let's talk about why. Are you having issues with anyone? I mean, we we are upcoming artists and stuff, mm -hmm. so people like. You know, when you like start doing better than people, mm -hmm. they start hating and stuff, you know what I'm saying? So you had some jealousy issues. Yeah, some, like jealousy issues, but gotten it. I haven't really been on there, but like he, he like my friend that's way now, God bless. He was telling me like, right, he always was telling me about how people, just like today, he was telling me some folks from up our way. Which, 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 up, which up your way? Like, girl, girl, girl beach. Beach, like that's where I used to stay, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So I grew up there, so. That's the, our, our hometown, you know. So what did he? What did your friend say about uh, from Vero Beach? What was he saying to you? He was saying basically just like. Then later in the interrogation, the officer would then ask, if you know who did this crime, would you tell me? Uh, by just telling me the truth, even if it's something that I don't want to hear, uh, but I, I respect the truth rather than BS. Okay, and a simple question. If you knew who did this, okay, you may or may not know. If you knew who did this, would you tell me? It's either a yes or no question. Answer. Honestly. Yeah, honestly. The truth. You wouldn't? I, I wouldn't want to be a part of it. I wouldn't want to be. As YNW Bortland does not give a firm yes or no answer using his voice. Instead, he shakes his head no. This is because if it was YNW Melly that did this crime, YNW Bortland would know that. Saying no to the officer could have caused Bortland's voice to come out as a different volume than what he's been using throughout the interrogation, which is due to him lying. This would have then been a clear indicator to police that he knows a lot more than what he's sharing. With the interrogation being leaked, J Hood revealing secrets, we would then hear from an anonymous juror doing an interview from the YNW Melly trial, which goes and reads, according to a juror who served in the YNW Melly trial, claims a majority of the jurors wanted to convict him. However, one woman who was on the jury was determined to find Melly not guilty, and she convinced two others to say he wasn't guilty too. Quote, his mom is lying. It was a 9-3 to vote, not the other way around. As this is all in response to YNW Melly's mother, Jamie King, who after the mistrial was granted, posted on her Snapchat saying, 9 not guilty, three guilty. It was a mistrial. My son will be home. God is still working. However, it gets a lot deeper than this. As it seems the juror that was causing the issues knew from the beginning she was not going to change her mind at all. Now, this is from local to the news right out of Fort Lauderdale. And they said most jurors wanted to convict Melly of two accounts uh, of the Broward County, the former juror has said. Now, this juror is speaking on the condition of anonymity, which means that they're not going to disclose their identity. Uh, the juror blamed the mistrial on one woman who served on the jury who appeared to be determined to acquit Jamel Demons. The juror goes on to say that from day one, she had issues with the four person selected. At one point, crossing her arms and saying that she was done. When another juror asked to not shut down and she set her feelings aside, she, she was a manipulative she was rude she yelled insulted everyone and she was just had a different opinion the juror stated that she was there just to cause chaos sources claim that she wanted to be a quote hero possibly wanting fame to be the one to save ynw melly's life in this case the original votes were 11 to 1 for ynw melly being guilty the juror that wanted to be a hero voted not guilty all by herself but then she would do something very unexpected on the last day of deliberation the former juror said that while it appeared that there was 11 to 1 to convict demons with the, the woman pulled two jurors aside and spoke to them for a few minutes and convinced them to come to her side. They stated, and I quote, then she came over and announced to the group that they had changed their minds. But when another juror asked why she was speaking for them, she, the former juror said, adding that the woman then hurled insults, including 
at the man who was questioning her. And without an agreement, Broward County Circuit Judge John J. Murphy declared the mistrial, and you guys remember that. However, the juror that did the anonymous interview would then reveal why they even spoke about the trial in the first place, which ends up making YNW Melly's mother look very unprofessional. The former juror said that the decision to speak up about what happened behind the scenes resulted from reports from Demon's mother, uh, Jamie King, who said that they were deadlocked at nine to three in favor of an acquittal, which again, we find out from this juror, is incorrect. The former juror said it was actually the opposite. She said that she had came out because she said, I don't want someone out there changing my vote. And she then goes on to say that you tell a lie enough, it becomes the truth. Now here's the best snippet. It says the next hearing for the case is on August 4th and Demon's team, as well as the prosecutors, agreed to start jury selection for the next trial on October 2nd. But again, we don't know if the judge is going to agree to a dual trial. 